I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this programme on pain management in primary health care, funded by the Department of Health and Ageing. For some people, pain becomes persistent and constant. They struggle to sleep, work and enjoy life. And chronic pain comes to dominate their lives. And the management of it is one of the most challenging tasks for primary health care professionals, including GPs. But there are many options available with significant advances in recent years and tonight's program aims to bring you up to date on the evidence-based approach to these people. The program is going out as a satellite broadcast over the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. Now let's meet our panel. Professor Brian Broom leads the postgraduate Mind and Body Healthcare Diploma and Master's program at AUT University in Auckland. He's a consultant physician in clinical immunology at Auckland City Hospital and has an interest in both the physical and non-physical dimensions of chronic pain. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Professor Michael Cousins has worked in the field of persistent pain for over 40 years as a clinician, researcher, educator and advocate. He's developed two major multidisciplinary centres in his career, one in Adelaide and the second in Sydney. And he's currently Director of Pain Australia, which is a coalition of organisations interested in advancing the national pain strategy, which you're going to hear about in a moment, and the Pain Management Research Institute at Royal North Shore Hospital at the University of Sydney. And he's also been a key driver of the national pain strategy. Welcome, Michael. Amy Norman. Dr. Milana Votrebeck is a general practitioner and a pain consultant and clinical tutor for the graduate medical programs at Notre Dame and Sydney Universities. Milana is the editor of Pain Management and General Practice. Welcome, Thank you. Thank you. Milana. Coralie Wells is president and founding director of Chronic Pain Australia. She's a, just recently been awarded a PhD from Sydney University, analysing issues for rehabilitation professionals working with people in pain within personal injury compensation systems. Dr. Coralie Wells. She works as a project officer in the Sketch Project with the Hunter Integrated Pain Service, HIPS, which you hear about later, and lives with chronic pain and is a consumer advocate. Welcome, Coralie. Thank you. Lois Tonkin is the specialist physiotherapist in charge and associate clinical lecturer at the University of Sydney's Pain Management Research Institute at Royal North Shore, as you just heard. Lois is part of the ADAPT Pain Management Program and committed to maintaining the quality of the physiotherapy component of the ADAPT Pain Management Program. Welcome, Lois. Thank you. And welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Corley, what are the typical stories you hear from members of your organisation in rural Australia? I think the two key factors we hear consistently from people that live in the bush are that they feel quite isolated, that they might have difficulty accessing pain management services and, uh, and I think that the net result is that you get um, this disconnection for people in pain in the bush. They experience pain the same but if they're not getting access to good services uh, and well, you could argue they experience it worse if they're not getting access right. to services. Mm. And of course, in terms of your advocacy, do we have many pain management centres outside of metropolitan Australia? No, we don't. But we have very caring doctors and others, but um, I don't think we have any centres at all in the bush for pain. Mind you, Milana, access to pain manage multidisciplinary pain management care is not so easy in metropolitan Australia either, is it? No, not at all. Um, in fact, you'd have to be particularly interested in doing this sort of work and bringing together people who are also interested, um, such as physiotherapists and psychologists, to help you manage these patients. Um, Michael, what are we talking about here? What is chronic pain? We're talking about a very difficult problem for a start, and it's been underestimated in its complex complexity and the difficulty in getting good outcomes. Uh, traditionally, it's been pain that persists for more than six months. That's a long time. And I think it's now being recognised that there is a transition from acute to chronic pain which passes through a phase where there's a, an opportunity for preventive medicine. And it's quite likely that uh, one can really know within the, certainly within the first month, whether this is within going... the first to, month? Yes, whether this is going to be uh, a problem with a high risk of progressing to chronic pain or, or a low risk. So I think we need to start looking for uh, red flags and yellow flags and other coloured flags too to give us uh, a better idea of whether this is a patient in whom we should be watching very, very carefully. So what are the features at one month which help to predict whether or not you're going to court chronicity? Well, if you're seeing a lot of what's called yellow flags, for example, um, in your evaluation you've really not identified any clear-cut physical factors that are operating in this patient. But on, on the other hand, the patient is quite convinced that they have had an injury and that 
if they make certain movements, there's a risk of further injury, uh, even serious risks of further injury. And so they're in self-protection mode. Yes, yes. They, uh, this is a very primitive thing, of course, for human beings to protect an injured part. Uh, but, of course, it becomes very counterproductive if the part is no longer uh, injured or has no injury to it that's posing any threat. Uh, and of course, Lois, just while well, I interrupt there, I mean, that's a situation where you get into this vicious cycle where you get muscle wasting um, and increased pain because of lack of activity in that limb or part of the body. Yes, we, you can get that, but it's really probably more an issue of making sure that people are feeling confident that they can move despite their pain. And this issue of confidence is really quite significant. We see patients lose their confidence very quickly. So there's a little questionnaire you could use at this stage, for example, which is called the PSEC, Patient Self-Efficacy Questionnaire. And if you find that the patient has a very, very low self-efficacy, well, then you should be concerned because they're not going to do the sorts of things, return to normal activities as they should. And if that happens, all the sort of secondary changes, such as postural changes, loss of muscle mass, uh, muscle tightness, et cetera, et cetera, are going to start to occur and will lead them on towards chronic pain. What other predictors? Well, uh, strangely enough, let's just talk about low back pain very prevalent problem strangely enough the predictors are all in the psychological and environmental domains they're not in the physical domain so for example uh, the relationship of the individual with their superior at work if it's very bad uh, that's a risk factor uh, if uh, the patient has a very high level of fear of re-injury and they exhibit what's called fear avoidance behavior and their instruments also to, uh, to document that. Uh, we've got data now for over 6,000 patients in our clinic, so normative data. So we can look at this individual and say, how do they match up against people who have severely uh, debilitated versus those not so, uh, with, with lesser disability? So these are the sorts of things that determine whether this is going to go on and become a chronic problem. Brian, what about life changes? People say that there's a, there's a similarity to people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder in chronic pain. In other words, somebody who's gone through a lot of life changes over the last year or two, divorce, job loss, um, somebody dying, that sort of thing. Uh, the, the sort of basic premise that I come from is that all bodily conditions uh, exist in a psychosocial context so that mind and body are never separate and that we need to address those from the beginning. Um, but from a psychotherapy perspective, um, any, any uh, major trauma or separation or loss makes, will feed into a bodily condition and become part of the vicious Creating cycle. a vulnerability. Yeah. Then there are other patients like uh, uh, males perhaps particularly who are not into uh, expressing feelings, uh, being responded to at a feelings level, uh, not willing to articulate their feelings or are more at risk because um, if in fact you don't express feelings into relationship you tend to express them in the body so they get somatized. And I think people with trauma histories uh, sexual abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse, they're much more prone to get um, uh, physical symptoms of all sorts, including pain. And what about the experience of pain in childhood, Michael? Well, it's, it's quite concerning. Uh, we don't have good data in this country. Uh, there are some data available overseas that indicate that as many as one in five children have various chronic pain conditions, such as headache, abdominal pain, and a number of others. Uh, if that's confirmed, that's a very concerning uh, piece of information because we know that a high percentage of those children with chronic pain in ch childhood have a high risk of going on to chronic pain in, it, in adulthood. And severity of pain? Is that a predictor? Uh, severity of pain, of acute pain, is a predictor uh, for chronic pain. It increases the risk of chronic pain. We don't know exactly why that is so far. It could be that the neuroplasticity changes that are being identified in chronic pain are starting to be generated at a critical phase of the acute episode. And if you don't uh, reduce the pain at that point, it's going to trigger a progression to chronic pain. But that's still being worked out. 
And Milana, is there much difference in the end between cancer pain and the chronic pain syndrome? Well, we tend to use Because cancer the, pain is chronic pain. Yes, but it has a finite, well, we, you know, in some cases, a finite time. But in uh, chronic pain in our general practice population, we tend to focus on those that are non-cancer pain. And um, my understanding is that uh, a lot of GPs have a great deal of difficulty, for instance, in using some of the um, stronger analgesics, the opioids, in patients who present with chronic non-cancer pain. Could I just come in there for a second, Norman? Uh, cancer pain can be lots of different types of pain. It can be acute pain, it can be chronic pain, it can be recurrent pain. And I, I think it does have to be treated a little bit differently during the treatment of the cancer phase compared to the situation for cancer survivors, which become much more like the patients with chronic non-cancer pain. So a cancer pain is actually quite a broad area of different pain types. There's nothing to stop them having a chronic pain syndrome? Not at all. Carly, what's your research said and, and your experience with your uh, members in terms of the effects of being in the workers' compensation system? Because I think this is another one of Michael's yellow flags. Mm. A lot of people uh, have great difficulty with chronic pain in uh, workers' compensation and other compensation systems mostly because we tend to, as a community, look for a reason for pain. We look for a physical reason and we can't always find a physical reason. And in those systems, if you can't find a physical reason, often there is a message sent that this person is malingering or they're, they're, not, they're imagining their pain. And unfortunately, people in pain can often take a message when they are referred to a psychologist. They can take a message which is, you think this is in my head. People say that a lot. It's a very common experience for people in pain. So the way we communicate that referral to a psychologist for help with coping is really critical. But to what extent does that interrupt the normal rehabilitation from an acute pain episode? In other words, in other words enhance the likelihood that you're going to go into chronic pain? Well, I have to say that I think that chronic pain is worse in compensation systems because of the structures in those systems. I think that the invalidation, the systematic invalidation of chronic pain within those systems is a major problem for people in pain yeah, and for health professionals who are I working with Could I come in them. and support that? Um, as part of this epidemiologic study we did uh, in the, with the New South Wales Health Department, there are over 17,000 respondents in that. Uh, we found that people in the workers' compensation system, all other factors being equal, uh, consumed more medication, uh, were sicker, and worryingly had more surgery than matched patients out of the system. Now, that says something worrying about the system, and incidentally, we call that a black flag, mm. because at the moment, it's like butting your head against a black mm. wall. And we, we do have blue flags, which are the patient's perception of what's happening to them within their workplace. If that's very negative, uh, you've got a blue flag waving. Milana, uh, several years ago I interviewed somebody from the University of Washington, Seattle, a pain specialist, who did a survey of Boeing workers with back pain. And what I'm getting at here is uh, the workers' compensation system that Carlos are referring to can make people worse. And it suggested that doctors can make people worse and can increase the likelihood of chronicity in terms of what they do. Now, from memory, they split them up into two groups. These are people with acute low back pain from working, building aircraft in the Boeing factory in Seattle. And one group were told, you know, this is a three-day condition, take some, you know, minofen as they call it, and, um, and you'll be fine. It'll just slowly get better. Um, the other group was told, oh dear, you know, this is really painful, you, you know, you've got to be very careful, let pain be your guide. And the first group tended not to go into chronicity and the second group did. Mm. Do we cause chronic pain as doctors? I'm sure we can give messages to our patients that are totally inappropriate to, to their well-being and their, the longevity of their pain may in fact be influenced by what we do say and sometimes even the non-verbal communications because we feel that we're not going to be able to do much about this. So I think sometimes it's us. Yes, yeah. indeed.
Because that self-efficacy, Coralie, that Michael was talking about is a critical issue because later on we're going to talk about self-management and you've got to feel effective as a human being. I Absolutely. think part of the problem is that you can pick up a message as a, as a person in pain and it's not the intended message but it can be, oh my goodness, I've never seen a back this bad. Mm -hmm. A physio can say that, a doctor can say that and it can be an unwitting kind of statement but the person in pain takes it away and that bruise over a period of time. One person said to me just recently, the surgeon said, I've got a spine like an 80-year-old. Mm. And that was his mantra. Mm. Mm. And of course, doing investigations that are unnecessary, Michael, can Absolutely. reinforce that. Well, this, this emphasises the importance of having a systematic approach to looking for red flags. And red flags are serious conditions that need to be diagnosed and may need urgent treatment. So if that's done and there are no red flags, well then messages should not be given, you've got a bad back. If this goes on, you'll finish up in a wheelchair, mm. those sorts of and I, I've seen patients who have received those messages. Mm. Whether they're intended or not is another matter, of course. And Brian, you believe and, uh, in, in capturing the whole person. In other words, the, the right at that front is just acknowledging the person yeah. as a, an individual in their context. Yeah, and I often use, as an educative tool, I say to a patient, if your back pain's due to anger, or alternatively it's due to a slip disc, which is more valid? and I let it sit there. And of course it's a nonsensical question because one's due to anger and one's due to a slip disc and they need different approach. So it's this sort of split between real and unreal, uh, between physical and non-physical that we get into as doctors right from the beginning. We look for the physical and then we say, all right, okay, now I can't find anything physical. Either there's nothing wrong with you, or if we're more kindly, we say, oh, maybe there are other factors. But we've already set in place a split between the mind and the body, which I think is really unhelpful and engenders chronic pain. What is neuropathic pain? Neuropathic pain used to be defined as pain uh, associated with uh, disease or injury to the nervous system uh, or changes in the function of the nervous system. There's a strong move now to remove the changes in function and to stay with disease and injury. What uh, difference does it make coming to that conclusion? Uh, well, it's a lot easier to identify disease or injury in the peripheral uh, nervous system, spinal cord or brain. It's not always entirely straightforward, but it's it's a lot easier. So what are you looking for to make the diagnosis? Well, there are a lot of instruments now to, to make this easier, but there are a number of things that those instruments have in common. Uh, for example, if the, if the patient reports uh, pins and needles, tingling, radiating pain, electricity-like sensations, it's quite likely that this is a neuropathic pain. Uh, if they have uh, sensory abnormalities such as loss of sensation in areas or even in big areas as with spinal cord injury, brachial plexus avulsion, the likelihood of neuropathic pain being present is, is extremely high. And the management changes? Management changes in that there are now some specific options, quite good options, uh, which in some patients work very, very well. Uh, but one of those options works probably only in 50% of patients, which means you've got to be prepared to look at different... These like the anti-epileptics? Yes, anti-epileptics, anti-convulsants, membrane stabilisers, quite a range of agents now that are available, and sometimes you've got to use them, uh, at least two of them, sometimes three of them together to do the job. But such agents are not appropriate for patients who have tissue injury or nociceptive pain and they're completely inappropriate for patients in whom psychological and environmental factors are really playing the major role. So it comes back again to being able to, uh, to carefully examine the presence of physical, psychological and environmental factors and consider them all as being equally important. So we've had various theories for chronic mm. pain syndromes and why they've mm. caused gate theory of pain and yeah. other things. Yeah. What's the current hot theory? Well, th and does it make any difference? I, I don't think it's quite like that. There's, there's been an evolution. The gate control theory focused attention on the fact that there was no one-to-one -one relationship between injury and the experience of pain. And from what we've been saying so far, it's quite clear that that's the case. Uh, the gate control theory has now been elaborated by an avalanche of basic and clinical research, including research in the psychological and environmental areas. 
And they all point to the fact that as pain persists, there are changes in all three of those domains, which all come down to neuroplasticity changes in the brain, the spinal cord, and the periphery. So the experience of pain changes the networks, changes neural the, networks. It changes the nervous system, and, and that is concerning. And initially it worried people that, well, that means it's, it's there for good. It's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity, and, and there are a number of studies now that demonstrate that these changes are potentially reversible. That doesn't mean to say they're reversible right now, but they, some of them are, and in the future I believe more of them will be. And presumably, Lois, some of the things that you do changes, can change the neural networks as well. Some of the early treatments in Yes, the in terms phase, of activity and exercise they and so can, on. can, yes, and, and we do know that these changes in the cortex of the brain. Certainly there's some evidence to suggest that that relates to inactivity. And so if we can reverse that or even prevent the inactivity occurring, there's a lot of support for the, the theory that we are actually changing the cortical um, representation of that area of brain and in turn the pain itself. Yeah, I'd just like to reinforce that because it's so important. Uh, there, there are very good imaging studies now showing changes not only in the sensory uh, areas of the brain, and that's not just the cortex, but also in the motor cortex. So it makes us realise that chronic pain is potentially quite a complex problem. And there are some very nice little techniques now, such as the mirror box is an early example. Uh, the jury is still out on the mirror box, but uh, by putting uh, uh, an unin uninjured, unamputated arm in a, in a mirror box and then having the brain tricked into thinking that the, the damaged or uh, amputated limb is actually moving normally, can in, in some patients provide pain relief for a period of time. Whether it does so permanently, we don't know. But a very important corollary of that is that in some chronic pain conditions, you need to reprogram the brain to be able to move a limb normally because that becomes lost. Corley, did you want to say something? Well, I was, just going to, I was just thinking about how, for some people, the magic ingredient is actually to introduce enjoyable activity into the world that they're living, and that can reorganise the brain as well. Because the pain gives them misery yeah. and dominates their, yeah. their lives. Just very briefly, Michael, the National Pain mm. Strategy? Well, the National Pain Strategy uh, represents an effort by 150 healthcare, and that means pretty well every healthcare organisation, and consumer and other organisations, and those individuals that contributed work towards a very detailed national pain strategy which included every facet uh, that needs to be pursued to improve the treatment of all forms of pain but focusing on chronic pain and and, and it has an evidence base in it so if you want it you can yeah. go to that website painaustralia.org.au let's go to our first case, first case study warren's a 36 year old wheat farmer who comes to see you milana in your general practice He's got uh, severe lower back pain, uh, which radiates down his uh, left leg to below the knee. Started when he got out of bed, he thinks he's got a slip disc and sciatica. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing we need to do is to get the history. We need to know about this patient. We need to know whether he's had episodes like this in the past, what has worked for him, what hasn't. We need to know what this pain might mean to him and his livelihood and his family. And then we need to examine... What sort of him. question do you ask to ask that? Um, I have a, a, a pain assessment form that I use for patients, particularly those who've had chronic pain. And, um, but would you use it for everybody with acute pain in your opinion? Um, in some cases we can. And in fact, I think some of the tricks of the trade are that if you've got a very busy general practice and you've got a waiting room full and your receptionist knows that the patient's come in with a pain, it's not a bad idea to give them... Oh, sorry. Not a bad idea to give them something like this to fill out while they're waiting. And by the way, on our website, we'll have, on Rural Health Education Foundation's website, we'll have links to some of these uh, assessment tools. Yes. And it gives us a heads up and it also helps the and patient. And it's global in terms yes. of their life. Yeah. Well, it is, um, but it does specifically focus on a pain presentation. But the nice thing about it is it also gives the patients insights into where their pain might be, the quality of the pain. Because for most people, you ask them, and what's the pain like? And they say, it hurts, doctor. Mm. And whereas with something like this, it gives you a, uh, an ability to assess words such as pins and needles that the patient may think, oh, yeah, that's what's happening, or it's, it's um, aching, or it's cramping. Words that we don't normally 
um, use when it comes to pain because we just say it hurts. Michael, what are the, the things we've got to hit? What are the points we've got to hit here in the biopsychosocial pain history, if you like, which is what Milana is talking about? Well, I, I think if, uh, very important is the circumstances of the onset of this pain, and, and that means the whole gamut of what was going on uh, in this patient's surroundings. Uh, and again, what, what is the meaning of the pain? What are going to be the implications? Will this destroy this patient's business by being away for even a short uh, space of time? Uh, then there are some uh, very uh, standard things that have to be gone through in a disciplined way if you're going to get a clear picture of what sort of pain this is. So where is the site or sites? And you've got to ask the patient to show you, not just tell you. Uh, what's the radiation, if there is any? And again, map it out uh, in detail manner. What's the character of the pain? And patients will often not give you the words, for example, that um, associated with neuropathic pain. They won't tell you that they've got a feeling like ants walking on the skin or somebody pouring boiling oil uh, into, a, into a wound in the skin. They won't tell you about those words unless you ask carefully because they'll think that you think they're crazy. But they're very important in determining whether this is neuropathic uh, or nociceptive pain. How do you get around that, Milano, with patients? They say, well, you're just like everybody else, it's all in my head. Although Warren's got acute pain, so we're mm -hmm. in a different That's situation. But that accusation that it's, you're just like everybody else, you're telling me it's all in my head by asking these, that psychobabble question. Well, I actually don't ever imply that it's only in their head. And I think that's an important thing because I think it's the stance you take with your patient and I think you have to believe them at, at well, what they tell you is what they are feeling. And Brian, I mean, this could take all day, couldn't it? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think as you're examining this patient and you're planning tests, you can stop and say, uh, what's, apart from the pain itself, what's the hardest thing about all this? What's the most worrying thing? What's on your mind when, when you're at home at night in bed and you're, you're lying there with the pain? What are you worrying about? And often that it'll just float to the surface. So I don't think it needs to be so much systematic. Although that's, an, that's more of the chronic pain situation, or do you think that's in the acute pain I, look, too? Look, I think it begins right at the acute stage as well. And of course, I should, I, I should say that the, our, our discussion here is predicated on, on the belief that you can actually interrupt. At the acute stage, you've got an opportunity to interrupt the path to chronic pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important. It's kind of a new idea. We, we focus on the injury, if there is one, rather than thinking this through. And I'm a strong believer that you don't have to be a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist to ask those sort of human opening up questions, which I think most GPs are capable of if they think about it. What red flags should be asked about at this stage, Michael? Well, uh, primarily you're interested in determining if there's a neurologic deficit or not, and that could even be a sub subtle deficit. So firstly, you want to know about uh, the red flags. We've talked about yellow flags, blue flags, and black flags, so let's focus on red Just flags. Just before you go on, well, yellow flags are the psychosocial yes. issues. What are yes, blue flags? Right. Uh, blue flags are, the, as I said a bit earlier, the patient having a negative perception of what's happening to them in the workplace, how people are responding to them in the workplace. That's, that's quite destructive to people, actually. And black flags? Uh, black flags are immutable hurdles in the system uh, that the patient views as being uh, very detrimental to their being able to get some sort of resolution, particularly in the workers' compensation system. Right. OK, so no red flags. So red flags are really crucial. Um, because they allow you to reassure or not the patient about some serious conditions that they have. So firstly, fracture. Uh, well, it obviously must be expected uh, to be a risk with uh, major trauma, such as a major motor vehicle accident or a fall from a height, but many other causes, major trauma. But also uh, with minor trauma, uh, that should say, or heavy lifting, uh, particularly in the older patients, the older age group patient, because they may be osteoporotic already, uh, or in other causes of osteoporosis, such as the use of steroids. Now, there's no physical examination factor that's been identified as being reliable in this sort of situation, so it's on the history. So that's the first one, fracture. Uh, the second one that you want to identify 
uh, is tumour or infection. And there's a bit of an overlap. Uh, there's particular risk for patients older than 50 years of age or younger than 20. You have to be a bit more careful with them. A, a prior history of cancer, uh, increased risk, uh, or risk factors for infection. And particularly with respect to cancer, but also in some infections, such as discitis, which is a really good and sometimes difficult one to pick. Uh, the pain is actually increased lying down, not decreased, and it's particularly bad at night. Now, if I can impart one message to the people listening tonight, if you use those two red flags, you're going to save a significant number of people from a very bad outcome. And again, physical examination doesn't really help. And then the final one is quarter equina syndrome, and this could result from a whole host of things such as a, an epidural hematoma, a spinal abscess, etc., or even inherent problems within the nervous system. So again, uh, hi history, saddle anaesthesia, patient reporting that they're soiling themselves, they can't feel in the saddle area. A recent onset of bladder dysfunction, that could be mainly control factors and severe and or progressive neurologic deficit. That's really what you're trying to identify here. And you can identify that from the history. The patient will tell you that they're starting to get some numbness, they're getting a bit of weakness, they're getting a foot drop, they're catching their toe. Uh, but then on physical examination, you can actually identify. So perianal or perineal numbness, uh, laxity of the anal sphincter, and a neurologic deficit in the lower limbs. Sometimes it's subtle. You've really got to compare one side with the other, the legs with the abdominal region, to find that there is a sensory change here or and or there's a motor deficit. And don't forget to ask the patient to stand on their tiptoes because if they've got a motor deficit, they won't be able to do that. So these are all bread and butter things, but... And they, you, and, they, and they guide your diagnostic tests, and if right. those are negative, yeah. you shouldn't be writing out You don't the need forms. to do x-rays and CAT scans if, if all of those are completely negative. And you can then say to the patient, you don't have any red flags, so there are no sinister conditions that are operating, and we must focus then on other things we can do to help you. And without doing that thoroughly, you can't move on. So in other words, you get sucked in, Milana, to the test cycle rather than dealing with the pain. Yes. And that's, and that's the serious risk, all those unnecessary head and back scans that we do, mm -hmm. which cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. So what are you going to do about Warren? So let's say he's, you know, he's, he's under pressure. The farm, you know, you know this, is, this year has been a good year for wheat farmers, but not necessarily every year. Um, the farm depends on him. Yes. And you know, with the drought, and recently the whole family's been under stress, and that, you can still see the effects of that, and he's got a really bad back, but none of the red flags. What are you going to do? Well, we definitely have to offer him some appropriate analgesia. You find out what he has taken in the past, what he's able to take. You need to know whether he has any problems with his uh, gastrointestinal system, if you were going to be ordering any kind of non anti-inflammatories. But I think the first port of call, if he hasn't already tried it, would be some paracetamol, perhaps some of the longer-acting versions, so he doesn't have to take them that often. But you must insist that he takes them regularly. And you also need to be able to monitor his response. And he really has to be encouraged to take that um, analgesic on a regular basis so that he keeps the lid on the pain. And you also encourage him to continue to be active, but to obviously a, a degree um, that is not necessarily sitting on the tractor all day. So he has to be kept active, he has to be given adequate analgesia, and you need to review him in a couple of days and see how he's going. And of course, if this is a fracture, Mm -hmm. rather than acute low back pain, regardless of where the fracture might be. Um, presumably there are the same risks of go going on to cro chronic pain, but with something physical like a fracture, presumably it's easy to forget about this global assessment of um, this chronic pain risk. Um, yes, you can get sidetracked because you've obviously got something that's tangible, it's biological, you can do something about it, you'll have to give uh, a better analgesic than some paracetamol of course. 
but um, it should be self-limiting. But at the same time, you need to be able to keep that patient active. If he breaks a, a forearm, you'd put it in a plaster cast. If he's broken, if he's, heaven forbid, crushed a, a vertebra from his fall, then, um, and it's stable, then you can probably, and I would defer to Lois here as well, as to what he could do physically to keep himself as mobile as possible during the healing phase. Is there evidence that referral, I mean, people argue about manipulation and chiropractic and so on, but in terms of just managing the pain, forget about the argument over low back pain interventions, that referral to a physiotherapist makes a difference in the acute pain situation? Yes, well one of the physical therapies and I think we have to start being careful that we're not just differentiating because some, in some areas you might only have access to one type of the physical therapy. But the purpose is mobilisation and staying active rather than any specific therapies. Yes, right? although once again the pain relief is important and so following the full assessment so long as the physical physiotherapist hasn't found any red flags or any concerns about red flags that they may wish to discuss with the treating doctor, they also should start the approach that some hands-on passive treatment mobilising can have that short-term effect, but the message must be consistently given that we are weaning off the hands-on treatment as we're increasing the patient's self-management and, and independent function. And what about psychological help yeah, at this stage? I was thinking here what I would be inclined to do with him would be to hold him sort of a holding measure, you know, support of a session perhaps once a week. It might be with the physio, it could be with the GP if he has a particular interest, it could be with a, a massage therapist or a chiropractor or an occupational therapist. It wouldn't matter if that person... But everybody, they've all got to have the same mindset. They've all got to have the same mindset and they've got to be into holding him through what is a very difficult phase so he doesn't feel abandoned or isolated and, and someone to talk through some of the conundrums that arise from being unable to work. And of course, Michael, with Medicare Locals coming on, if they work mm -hmm. as they're intended, mm -hmm. this sort of multidisciplinary care could be more possible. It even could be, and, and one of the key issues is time. Time and money, in fact. They go together, unfortunately. And what's needed at a primary care level is really a, a mirror, not exactly the same, but the same ingredients as currently exists in multidisciplinary pain centres. So we need a a GP who's interested and motivated and knowledgeable uh, to be involved in this area. We've got a question, Milana, uh, from Queensland. Is acupuncture, is there any evidence for acupuncture in acute pain or indeed chronic pain? Um, there's still a lot of debate. I have a colleague who's actually done a paper on and had it published uh, in The Lancet regarding the use of, of laser rather than acupuncture. Um, there appears to be some benefit but whether or not it but works. it's the needling rather than yes. the uh, acupuncture itself is my understanding. Yes. But I think it's really important that, that if it were, that, that people are exposed to those options because for some people it's marvellous. You know, people will tell us that they've had a great experience of avoiding using medicine because they've actually had some relief and benefit, especially at acute pain stage. But look, I think the, the great opportunity with the Medicare locals is to get the ingredients in there that are needed. So the ability to assess physical, psychological and environmental factors. So uh, I put out a plea really to our primary care practitioners to get involved in the Medicare local process and to make sure that the patients with chronic pain don't get left out. Because to really do the job properly, we're going to need a clinical psychologist, a nurse, a physical therapist and a GP to start learning to work as a team on chronic pain problems. And when that happens, this whole process will be so much easier because the money will be there to pay for the amount of time that's needed to do this properly. And you've got to do it properly because these are often not easy problems. I was just going to go back to the acupuncture question. There definitely is evidence that acupuncture is equal to placebo, mm -hmm. but both of them are better than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So there is a belief in that, an impl mm. implied belief that the acupuncture will be helpful and that's where the, the now, comparison with the Now we've got pain placebo. assessment tools uh, accessible from the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. Are they all the same? They're all validated? Doesn't matter which one you use? Look, I think whatever it is that you can use and continue to use that is helpful for you I think is, is valid. Now there are of course ones that have been used in research and so therefore they've been validated I presume. But I think 
at a GP level, I think whatever it is that you can use, that you've mm. got time to, that your patients are willing to fill out and, and that it's easy to apply and that you actually use them and use them not just in the initial phase, but as a, as a you know, if there's ongoing problems that you can revisit the pain assessment tool and see where the patient's up to because how, how often we see patients who believe they're not any better but when they review their pain scores they actually found that they're mm. actually better and they feel better for the fact that they know now yeah, tracked they've it. tracked it and they're, they're actually awesome. improving. Awesome. I'd just like to draw attention to the impact study uh, which was a study of instruments that are available and validated for chronic pain. I think that's important to use instruments that are validated for chronic pain and the impact study identified the fact that you need information in a number of areas such as uh, physical functioning, psychological functioning, uh, the presence of depression and anxiety, fear avoidance behaviour, uh, self-efficacy and catastrophizing. Now they're all things that have been found to play quite a big part progressively in chronic pain so whatever instruments are used those things ought to be assessed. And there are some simple questionnaires, the form of the Orobro questionnaire, which came out of Scandinavia, mm. the Start Back from the UK, which are very nice short questionnaires that are suitable in primary practice for mm. physiotherapists, doctors. Yeah. If we've got the waiting room, we've always got these six or nine mm. questions that are very easy. The, the issue with the questionnaires is whatever it is perceived is the problem must be then acted upon. Yes. And so we must respond to what we see in the questionnaire yes. as to how away. we will address that with mm. the patient. And of course, that's the part of the fear that general practitioners have, the open a can of worms. We mm. don't know actually what to do with it. Sometimes. And that's why you're watching this program, because we're actually going to tell you. Brian, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, I just want to go back to uh, Lois's comment on uh, uh, the acupuncture and the placebo. A placebo can be a, actually quite a powerful effect. I think that's what Lewis was yeah, saying. And that's yeah. what she's yeah. saying. And Daniel Mormon yeah. called it the meanings response rather yeah. than the placebo response, which sort of is a sort of a positive spin on what has become a rather negative term. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we should be mobilising the meanings response in our management of patients. And if a patient finds that acupuncture and needling and the particular acupuncturist who's doing the needling is a very sort of therapeutic person, then that's clearly the way to go. No, thank uh, you but for it, clarifying uh, that. Yeah, Maybe yes. rather different for like. other patients. Yes. Just come back to if it's a fracture, because presumably we under-treat acute pain, and if there's a really severe pain, then you're creating a problem for the future. So, so putting on a plaster in the emergency department and saying see you in a couple of days in the fracture clinic is not actually good enough. No, no, you definitely have to use appropriate analgesics for um, for even that very short acute phase to get the patient to feel comfortable. Um, and again, regular analgesics, absolutely. which might be more powerful than um, paracetamol and yes. um, yes. non-steroidals. Yes. Okay, so he comes back in six months and he says, well, thanks for looking after me then, it's still there, it's really bad now. It comes and goes a bit, but really I'm living with it most of the day and it's really not good. Mm -hmm. um, and it's affecting my life, can't think about it and... Um, you know, even my farm workers are thinking I'm malingering and I'm just bullshitting about this. Well, I think the first, uh, first duty of care of any general practitioner is to reassess the situation, not only to get uh, an adequate history of what's going on right there um, at that point in time, but also to re-examine the patient and make absolutely sure that we're not missing anything. And um, then we have, in fact, uh, a patient who is going to need a lot of support and also need to have some patient education. I think it's terribly important for patients to be given uh, an, an ability to understand their pain. So what, Carly, where are they going to get that patient education from? Where, what, what can the GP look to to help him or her teach the patient about GPs their GPs that are pain? interested, there's a very easy to read um, publication by Lorimer Mosley called Explain Pain. And although it's meant for patients, I find that patients often can't understand it, whereas GPs and other health professionals get a lot out of that particular publication. Um, but if you go to any of the consumer organisations like Chronic Pain Australia, which is the one that I'm involved with, we publish consumer information to help people at the lay level understand what's going on with pain, what's happening in the nervous system, what's happening in the immune system, so that you can get a framework to explain your experience, your chronic pain that hasn't gone away. And in some parts of Australia, like Western Australia, New South Wales, there are programs to help do That's that. That's right. Well, there's a STEPS program in 
uh, Fremantle, which a lot of people um, speak highly of. Um, there's the HIPS program. Both of those programs, HIPS is in the um, Hunter area, but the STEPS program, which is uh, just showing there on the screen, it's uh, about offering people education before the full multidisciplinary program so that you actually get some information up front and what they find is that some people find that's enough to interpret their pain and to frame their pain and they don't go on to need the multidisciplinary. Similar program in the Hunter uh, in Newcastle. There is a, um, a strong educational focus up front. But and this, this doesn't help somebody living in Kalgoorlie or um, in both of those Hill. Web, both of those organisations have websites which will offer um, information for people that live with pain. And I should give a promo to our good uh, Professor um, Cousins here. He's written a book called Fast Facts, uh, Fast Facts on Chronic and Cancer Pain, which... Uh, that's, for G, that's for healthcare practitioners, healthcare professionals, GPs, etc. I think we should also mention the book Manage Your Pain, uh, which has now been around for about 15 years. It's on ABC Books and it's available in different languages. Oh, we have another promo here. <laughs> mm. um, yes. Thank you, um, Michael. This is... Yeah, this is the strategies that we would be recommending. That's a very handy handbook for therapists and for patients as well. Okay, so that's patient knowledge. Brian, what would you be doing with him at this stage, given that he's clearly in a, in a chronic persistent pain situation, if you were the GP? If I were the GP... Remembering G and you've got limited access to uh, high high-powered pain management centres. Yeah, and limited access to clinical psychologists and all the, the whole rest. Bit. You got it. The whole bit. Uh, um, I, I'm a great believer in language revealing what's going on. Um, a pain, of course, as well. <laughs> but um, uh, people reveal uh, in the little that they say what's happening. And there's a patient here that we were talking about who feels useless. Now, I would put a high uh, emphasis on a patient use of a word like useless and I would be amplifying that space around that and exploring it with him and holding it, holding him, at, not in it, but holding him through it and understanding it. So I... Uh, so is understanding therapy or have you got to then use that, uh, which is Lois's point, to actually intervene with cognitive behavioural therapy or something active, changing the cognitive structure, if you like, of that person, the way they think about their pain? Um, I, I think them understanding and being understood are probably the two most fundamental things. So it's a relationship between the clinician and the patient. So the re relationship is dynamic and mobilises something positive. And, um, Mi and Michael has referred to it, and you've referred in the past, that it's not just a blind referral to a clinical psychologist. No, no. They've actually got to know what they're talking about. Yeah, yep. yep. I think mm. the important thing there, and we may come back to it later, is that uh, a lot of very good psychologists and psychotherapists are no good with bodily conditions because they won't allow the body into the room. They're scared That's somebody it. else's job. It's someone else's job. It's the doctor's job. And if the patient says, look, I'd like to talk to you about my bodily condition, my pain, or if you talk to the doctor about it and the pain is dismissed, it's discharged over there to the, to the doctor and it, it's quite negative, really. So I think uh, the first thing is that the, um, the doctor is psyche-inviting and the psychologist or the psychotherapist is body-inviting. And if, uh, it goes both ways. I think an, another key thing to determine at this stage is how much uh, has the patient been involved in continuing passive strategies. So this is where hands-on physiotherapy should not be still going on. And it certainly should not continue to go on for another six months and another six months and another, which is what unfortunately can happen. Uh, so this so is like manipulation and things like that? Uh, any, any sort of hands-on passive, so anything that's done to the patient uh, it can include anything you like. Uh, that's not going to help and the evidence is very clear at this stage that that's not going to help. So all it's do is, doing is wasting time for this person. And if that has been happening, you can expect to see uh, that there's going to be postural changes, there'll be potentially loss of muscle mass, it can happen very quickly, uh, even trophic changes, so nutritional changes in the skin and uh, stiffness in joints, and together with the, the mood changes and the use of some medications, which can, such as opiates, which can produce uh, bad mood changes, 
this person will be getting into a vicious circle and going down a spiral. And it's very, very hard to come back up that spiral. They'll need some pretty vigorous help. And there is that. some evidence that while we underuse opiates in cancer pain, we overuse them in Australia, and particularly in some areas in chronic pain syndromes. Well, and perhaps uh, significantly prescribe them to the wrong patients. And a patient in whom there is no evidence whatsoever of no susceptive or neuropathic factors operating should not be given opiate drugs. This is not the right treatment for them. We've got a slide, uh, Milana, about a you know, checklist for people on pain management medications, which you, you know, general practitioners need to consider. Let's just go through that checklist, which shouldn't take you very long, but is, is a systematic way of just dealing with it. Well, in fact, they can get this information from the National Prescribing Service, and I think we've all been uh, made aware. NPS Medicines Wise, as they're now known. That's the yep. one, Medicines Wise. Um, there are lots of issues in this list, but I think some of the important things is uh, the take-home messages for the GP to allow the patient to ask questions about their meds and make sure that the patient knows what they're doing with their medications and what to look for um, regarding side effects and of course any kind of um, multiple medications that they may be on, even those that are not prescribed, need uh, the patient's uh, awareness and the GP should also make themselves aware of what the patient has been taking um, alongside any other medications you might be recommending. So let's talk about the intervention now. What's the gold standard of intervention in chronic pain. We talked about assessment, we've talked about listening, which is part of that psychological intervention. Um, what's the, and we've talked about how it's multidisciplinary, so it's not more investigations unless there are red flags. Would you re-administer a red flag questionnaire at chronic, when you think they've got chronic pain, Michael? Absolutely. So you, you re-administer that and you check for all those flags. Mm -hmm. So give me a sense of what the activity element is. If Michael's banned you from doing manipulation and massage, what is it that physiotherapists that? do with chronic pain? Well, I think first up, Coralie... This is the first time you've heard Michael say that, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Coralie said earlier, we need to try and help people find pleasurable experience, uh, activities. They need to be meaningful experiences too. So we have to set goals that mean something And this is about general patient. body toning, making yourself fitter. Yeah, well, first off, we, first off, we have to know what the patient wants to achieve. Where is the patient going? What does the patient think the pain's all about and what would they like to be doing if they were managing their pain better? So having established that, we can then set up a, an activity, an exercise, a functional program specifically designed to helping that patient achieve that functional goal. And so it, they sh the patient should be aware of some relevance of the exercise program to their functional outcomes. So it's not so much which exercises patients do, but more in the way they're encouraged to go about applying them. So a very setting realistic, achievable baseline starting point, then a graduated upgrade as they're using some of this knowledge that they've learnt about pain to help them deal with what we would call a flare up of the pain. And I think some of the workers' compensation systems fail us because every time a patient has a flare-up of pain, they have to justify it as an injury. Mm. And it's this terminology that we've discussed early. Yeah. Brian and then yeah, Michael. Yeah. Kind of, yes. um, I think the question as to what is the gold standard implies that there is a clinician methodology that should be applied across the board. Across the board. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't think it's like that. I think it it's is... It's tailored to what, what you find it, out It's by entirely the person. individual. So mm. while statistically, if you take them as a group, it might be negative for um, patients to have physiotherapy at this stage, there might be 5% of them who really need to be touched. But you wouldn't know that unless you actually were very person-centred. But you know that as a general group. It shouldn't be applied as a general policy. Uh, would you agree with that, Michael? Uh, provided it's for a short <laughs> space of time, yes. because well, well, you you see, know, again, this patient is going downhill yeah, rapidly. But again, uh, my, my premise was based on the fact that until you know what the patient, you don't know whether the mm. patient's going downhill mm. or not mm. in the case that I was yeah. giving, so it becomes highly individualised. Yeah, I think if it's individualised. Mm. Uh, the other thing I should say in response to your question, Norman, is that it's not just getting fit. Uh, and a lot of patients make the mistake of thinking if they go to the gym and get a gym instructor, they'll be right. They won't. They'll be in a lot more trouble uh, because it needs to be determined what sort of problems do they have. Do they have a completely frozen shoulder now? 
uh, when they started off with some neck pain. And that might su be surprising, but it, it, it does happen because they get into this inactivity and the shoulders get frozen very quickly if you're not moving them through a full uh, range. And presumably they can have put on weight, so you Absolutely. get all sorts of barriers to move yeah. forward. So there are a lot of specific things that need correction in an environment where they're prepared to do that. And that's one of the important things about intensive But it's fine behavior. if you can uh, wait the six months to get in to see you mm. at your clinic or you know, in a country town, what do you do? Well, it doesn't have to be done in our clinic. This is the sort of thing that should be able to be done uh, even in a rural environment, provided the right ingredients are there. Now, that's something we've got to work on. It's not there at the moment. It's got to be worked on. Uh, if these people continue not to respond, well, then you can consider moving them on to the tertiary level. But the large majority of this should be able to be done at a primary care level. I was just going to say that I think what we're sort of all sort of um, chipping around here at is that the more that we can foster a relationship which is about being partners, so that's the, the GP or the, or the physio or the counsellor and the person in pain in a partnership, which is quite equal. So there's a mm -hmm. conversation going on and it's, and it's talking about, I mean you've, you've introduced the, t the topic of the story of the person, Brian, and mm -hmm. I think from the earlier stage, if there is this real sense that the person in pain feels that they're an equal partner in this production, which is how am I going to get through my pain, I think that you've got a much better chance. And that's about the relationship. Well, that's precisely what the National Pain Strategy is talking about. Yep. It's a network, and the network uh, extends all the way from the community uh, into the tertiary level. And that means both ways, in all directions at every point. And of course there's a self-management word er earlier. i um, just got a question, we're running out of time, but we've got a question about what happens, you know, if I'm a GP, and this question comes from uh, Victoria, what happens if um, I, I see somebody who is, has been on opiates from another practice inappropriately with chronic pain syndrome, how do I manage that situation? And I'm sure you see that often. Milana? Um, I think you first have to get the patient on board that this is probably not helping them and if they're still mm. in pain then the medication isn't doing what it's meant to do. But they'll be scared and escalating of coming off it. Them. Ah, but yeah. escalating. And there are significant problems coming yeah. off them. Yeah, they? sure. Mm. But you have to be able to offer them something alternate to it and, and point out to them there are other medicines and that the, maybe the pain they've got at the moment is totally inappropriately treated, not to say that the so other doctor So is it a specialist job it. to get them off their opiates? I. I, um, I think this doctor is in a particularly difficult position because obviously he's inherited somebody else's patient and therefore that could be the problem. But he may actually be in a much better position being the new kid on the block to actually help this patient because I think the old doctor would probably have been tempted just to escalate the dose rather than do something about getting I mean, the patient off. That's a really important part, isn't it? Because a lot of people um, who come to us in trouble have been managing their pain quite well not higher, not lower, for a long time, and they're functional. Mm -hmm. They then have to move for whatever reason. They can't afford the housing, whatever it is. They go to a new doctor who will not prescribe, and they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not a, it's, it's not, it's not a sledgehammer. No, and it's not easy. Just quickly, I think, we should, sorry, Michael. Quick comment on that. Uh, the, uh, I think the first thing in, in handling the situation is to make sure that the patient has correct information about the long-term effects of taking opioids and, th and those effects are not small. Uh, there are considerable downsides to spending the rest of your life on opioids and if you're now six months into it well there's no guarantee that you won't still be there in two or three or five years time so that has to be done in a very factual way and that uh, will tend to give them a, a much different view perhaps than the view that they have that this is all quite harmless and fine and we can keep going forever. Uh, but it, it is sometimes quite complex getting people off opioids, but there are a few things that are important. And as Milana said, you've got to replace the opioids with something else. You can't just stop them. And you also need to potentially use some aids, such as the drug clonidine, and sometimes for a period of time adding some carefully controlled doses of benzodiazepine so they don't experience a very, very unpleasant experience. Just very briefly, can you just take us through this patient pain, con the pain con toolkit and the things? Who's there's um, a number of resources. Uh, New South Wales government has, uh, I think we saw the slide earlier, there's a, a beautiful rundown on what you can do if you're a person in pain. And that includes uh, uh, creating a team around you of, of partners in your pain uh, management. Um, 
learning as much as you can about your pain condition and how pain works in your body, the physiology of pain if you like, and then learning about what activities you want to do, setting goals as, as Lois said earlier, that's all on the New South Wales Government website, which I think is in the, um, in the list mm -hmm. on the credits of this show. There's also um, a patient toolkit which people might find first, it's quite simple, uh, but it might be a good starting point. I think that's at uh, patienttoolkit.org mm -hmm. is, the, is the web address for that. Look, thank you, Albert. We could, we could go on for quite some time, but the satellite is going to move on and leave us behind, so we need to finish there. What are your take-home messages for those watching, Lois? Ah, helping patients remain confident enough, despite their pain, that they can continue to increase their function, ideally as they're reducing their reliance on medications, passive treatments, so that they're achieving those functional outcome goals. I think if, if the doctor and the primary care practitioner can work on the relationship and reduce the isolation of chronic pain and uh, look for resources outside the practice which are easy to reconnect people with the community and maintain them in the community. Lana? I think GPs are in the ideal position to perhaps prevent some of the chronic pain situations that we see because they're there and they know their patients. But even if it's a chronic pain patient, they should not despair because there's a lot of um, help out there for the patients and themselves to improve the lot of these people. And we haven't, there was a question here about TENS. Do yes. you believe TENS works? Well, it may be placebo action. Um, I have uh, watched patients use it over many, many years, in fact 30, and um, there's a variable response, but I do believe that it can help some people. And I mean, I even had a patient who uh, used it without any batteries and it worked, so. <laughs> <laughs> mm, <yes. laughs> and do you believe, I mean, have you seen people get better from chronic pain syndromes? Well, you see, this is how we need to measure that very much more accurately, what is getting better. They may not be pain-free, but they may be getting out there and enjoying their lives again, and I think that's worthwhile. So you've got to set realistic expectations. Yes. Michael, your take-home messages? I, I'm going to answer that last question. Yes, there are some chronic pain conditions right now that can be uh, apparently permanently cured. An example is a patient with uh, nerve irritation which has caused a fairly substantial and, and long-term pain to, to this point. Uh, sometimes as few as two doses of transferaminal steroid will stop that problem. Uh, there's also the condition of brachial plexus avulsion, which can cause excruciating pain. Dorsal root entry zone lesions can produce more than 20 years of complete pain relief. Now, there, there, are, there are others, uh, which again points to making a thorough evaluation and that's where I'll start my answer. Uh, there are some new uh, tools available now, uh, some newly documented strategies that need to be used to take a, a thorough uh, clinical history and to provide appropriate examination of a patient with chronic pain. So I encourage GPs to be aware of that uh, and other health professionals, particularly the identification of red flags so that you can go on and reassure the patient uh, that this is a condition that might need other than surgery or nerve blocks or drugs. Um, I, I think it's a very important time in the field of chronic pain management because I think we have to acknowledge that things have not been going well. So the opportunity to implement the national pain strategy, particularly at the GP locals level, Medicare uh, locals, uh, Medicare locals is, uh, is a very important one and I, I hope that uh, GPs emerge who want to form a group with a psychologist and a nurse and a physiotherapist to have the, the capability of doing the sorts of things we've discussed. Brian? Um, I think for generations we've been hoist with this notion that mind and body can be treated separately. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as a bodily condition that isn't in some way influenced by our subjectivity or our psyche or our uh, mind. I think uh, in pain, uh, that whole problem comes home to roost. And uh, mind and body factors are present from the beginning and they are present all the way through and they should be attended to from the beginning. And that we just ask for trouble and probably create uh, extra chronic pain by not attending to them from the beginning. 
Thank you all very much indeed. That's been fascinating and I hope you found it uh, useful too. Uh, there's a free DVD of the programme available to you and you can order it from the Rural Health Education Foundation and if you go to their website you can also obtain more information about the issues raised tonight. That's rhef.com.au. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing and of course our panel members for making the programme possible and also thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms to register for your CPD points and we'd also just like to know what you thought about the programme. I'll see you next time. I'm Norman Swan. Good night for now.